Hello, I'm Kevin Benedict, Senior Vice President of Solution Strategy here at Regalix. And I'm so excited today to uh, be a part of the CIO Water Coolers uh, IT Leadership Series. I've been asked to host this by the team, and I want to thank you, and I'm honored. And I want to welcome our guest here, Nigel Wilson, Global Strategist for Microsoft. Nigel, thanks for joining us today. No problem, Kevin. And, and I, too, am uh, honored to be uh, kind of asked to, to be on this conversation with you today. So, pleasure. And especially since it's a Friday evening uh, for you, I'm here in Boise, Idaho, in the mountain time zone here in the U.S. Where are you calling in from today? Uh, so I'm calling from the south coast of the U.K. So um, it's uh, very definitely evening here. Um, the uh, very, very dark outside, clocks haven't gone yet, back yet, and very cold as well. But I'm, oh uh, I'm yeah, so it was good. Thank you for letting us take a part of your weekend here. Um, we're going to talk about, from a leadership perspective, I'm sure that you have the opportunity to speak with many large companies, uh, to share ideas with different audiences. So we're just going to kind of brainstorm and talk together here and share with the audience what we're seeing out there at this time. So let's get started here. And let me just, uh, I'm going to just start with an introductory question here and say, what are you seeing out there? from a um, kind of an IT strategy perspective and business strategy, what are you seeing out there, the trends that are most interesting to you? Um, so kind of most interesting, I guess, is that we're, we're still at that stage of um, cloud adoption um, for some kind of quite mature, for a lot still kind of on the journey, uh, and for, for many kind of waiting at the periphery to, uh, to kind of start. Um, and, and I guess, I mean, I work with professional services customers, so the, the big four in professional services. So, you know, they're advising their clients as well. They've made the leap. They're all in in terms of kind of cloud. Um, but I would say the kind of big thing that I come across is that diversity of those people that are quite mature in terms of their move of their IT infrastructure into the cloud and, and those that are, are still kind of waiting to, waiting to start. Um, and, and I guess the thing that I see is is the kind of the main blocker is is that of security. Everybody's kind of concerned um, about cloud security, uh, which is quite interesting when you actually look at um, how secure some of these big data centers, not just Microsoft data centers, all of the big cloud vendors, how much uh, kind of effort and money goes into securing them. Uh, and quite often, you know, customers come to us with a list of security requirements and and say, you know, can you do this, 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 and this? And we go down a great big checklist and tick them all off. And we always say to them at the end, and, and if that was your data center, could you tick all of those boxes? Uh, and that's when it all kind of goes quiet and they pause for thought. Yeah, and I know that most companies would not ever be able to have that level of security. So let me ask you a question about the impact of this kind of uh, moving to the cloud is having on leaders and management. Do having the applications in the cloud actually change the way businesses operate? Uh, absolutely, for sure they do. Yeah, uh, and, and I'm not just saying that working for a company that's a provider of cloud services either. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things, again, you know, I, I've kind of been in the industry, as uh, you know, I'm sure you have and a lot of people listening have for a long time now. Uh, and one of the things that came up over and over again is, is kind of how much effort every time we had to do kind of a server upgrade to the latest version, you know, how long that kind of took. And, you know, you, you would come out with a new version of software and it would take some customers two years, maybe three years to get onto the latest version. You know, in, in cloud infrastructure now, they, these, you know, they, these services are being upgraded, you know, sometimes on a weekly, uh, definitely monthly and, you know, often quarterly basis. Uh, and, and it's not just the frequency of the updates, it's the, the facilities and new features that, that get added. Um, and, and in the world that we live in, which is constantly being disrupted, the you know it's really important that you kind of have the latest feature set and the the latest you know tools in your armory available to you. Um, and uh, you know for sure, I think that um, there's a there's a massive difference that, that all customers that have moved to the cloud and benefit that they're kind of finding from it once they've made the move. Well, and that's absolutely something that I see. And uh, our research data, when we're doing our research reports, we find that same thing. Speed is so critical to today. Uh, the rate of disruption is accelerating. So things are changing so quickly 
that if you don't have an IT infrastructure that can support keeping up that pace and that accelerating pace of change, then you're stuck and that's going to be a painful experience for you. Yeah, so so it, it, it's a challenge. So absolutely, you know, the kind of technology is there and we just kind of talked about the rate of change and all these new features becoming available. But I think the thing that doesn't change is um, the, the kind of difficulty that a lot of organiza- organizations have um, to, to kind of manage that change. Um, so that that's kind of management at the kind of people level, getting the people to buy into the change. Um, but that's also changing kind of processes because, you know, the technology is great because it underpins everything. But at the end of the day, if, you know, if the people aren't willing to change and the processes don't change, then all the te- technology is doing is kind of reinforcing, you know, for some companies, bad habits. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it, it's absolutely definitely we used to kind of like when, when I first started at Microsoft nearly 20 years ago now, you used to have this kind of mantra of people process technology. And that was always the order that we talked about it in. So, you know, it's kind of like people from the customers, the, you know, the people within the organization, the management, uh, the kind of processes. And, and if you don't change the processes, then you don't get the benefit of the technology. And, and a lot of companies, I think, you know, are kind of seeing that they're investing a lot in technology and not seeing benefit because they're not changing the process and not getting the people buy in. Yeah, we see a lot of processes that exist today that were created in an era of analog processes, if you would, where everything was driven by physical processes and the movement of paper. And those processes still exist today. So right now, it's often necessary for companies to rethink those processes from the very beginning and say, why did we do it that way? And is there a digital way in uh, in now that we're using Uh, digital platforms and digital technologies that can bypass much of what we used to do in the analog era. How how long did it take us to mention digital transformation then, Kevin? Um, (laughs) We got there quite quickly, didn't we? (laughs) What's interesting is I asked that question in a recent study of over 2,000 executives, and and I I asked them, you know, when do they expect digital transformation uh, efforts to end? And the majority, of course, said never. Right. Mm. This is this is a process and this is something we're not just going to experience for a time. But I imagine digital transformation will never find an end. Yeah, I I absolutely agree. So, I mean, there's a couple of things. One, it was some interesting. uh, So I'm quite active on on Twitter uh, and kind of earlier on this evening, there was a bit of a debate going on around digital transformation and somebody commenting about the fact that, you know, the words were in the wrong order. Um, because, you know, you see digital first and you think it's all about the technology, but actually it's the transformation, the change in business process that, that's kind of important. And, and I absolutely agree with you. Um, you know, we see disruption everywhere and, and our reaction to disruption is that we need to put a plan in place and we need to be the disruptor. But actually we need to be continual disruptors. Uh, and there are just so many examples now uh, of, of companies that have gone out and disrupted and then they think their job is done. But actually, it's an iterative process, and it's going to be a never-ending cycle. Oh, yeah. And I do think there's a real risk out there of getting ahead of culture, as we've talked about. You know, the digital transformation, the pace of that is accelerating beyond the capabilities of our own employees. And we see the ramifications of that in politics and our society as well. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Uh, but but also, you know, some of the I, I see some of the business now tr- trying to drive the change and some of the people as you get, new, you know, millennials and kind of new people into the workforce, they come with expectations uh, and they, they have kind of ideas about, you know, the technology that should be there and be used, you know, quite, quite old and antiquated technology in some organizations. Uh, and they're kind of living the, the kind of mobile, you know, the mobile life on their mobile phones uh, and, and trying to kind of get to grips with um, technology, so it's a challenge for them because um, the technology to them they see it as old technology. So it's, it's you know it's non-mobile, it's on a desktop, or um, you know it's it's kind of like slow slow to be updated. So I think you've got two issues: you've got the younger generation, and then you get the older generation that are maybe slightly more resistant to change. And and absolutely agree with you. You know it's the culture of that organisation needs to kind of support and embrace um, you know all generations in, in you know in in making sure that that change happens. So last year at Davos, at the World Economic Forum, a number of papers were published that were um, introducing the fact that they believed we were now entering the fourth industrial revolution. So, Nigel, what's your thoughts on that? Do you agree? 
Um, so I think one of the things is we can get really hung up about the fact that they called it the fourth industrial revolution. Um, um, they, they kind of then went on to say that it was, a, as you quite rightly said, that it was a, technolog a technological revolution. And I think that's kind of more ac accurate. Um, when you kind of like a, a look at industrial revolution, it has kind of connotations of the past and previous ways of working and, and kind of industry and factories. Uh, and that's definitely not the way that we are. Uh, we, we, you know, we're, we're kind of at work anymore. So I kind of agree with it and I disagree with it. I, I agree that it is a revolution, but I think it's you know, less industrial, more technological. Um, and there's a, a guy that I follow, a futurist, and, and his name's Dave McCormack. And he is not a plug for his book, by the way. Um, but, he, but he wrote a book called Biz 4.0. And what he was saying is it's around business 4.0. It's not around the industry because, you know, in actual fact, the, 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 um, the industrial model is no longer fit for purpose. So it, it kind of doesn't um, make sense in the kind of modern world. Um, so I absolutely agree that, you know, we're in this technological revolution and the constant change. Um, but I think that, you know, a lot of people have got hung up on the, the, the terminology that they used. So digital transformation as a term that's been around for probably four or five years and everybody uses it. Some of my colleagues uh, press me to change that term. They say, you know, that's old stuff. We're all beyond that. But what do you think? Uh, <laughs> so I think certainly certain of these terms kind of, um, I, I don't know, they're, they're trendy things to say. I, I remember the, the phase that well, I'm sure you do as well, the phase we went through of, of just kind of overusing the word innovation just for anything and everything. Um, so I think sometimes these tags that we add on to things kind of get the visibility that we need within the organization. Because if you say that you're going to do something around digital transformation, everybody kind of listens up to what you're about to say. Um, but actually kind of underpinning it, um, it is kind of quite, um, uh, quite kind of well, a well-trodden path. So as I said before, you know, it is about the kind of people and the process. It's about the customers at the end and the customer journey, all the things that we've been doing for a long time. So I think, you know, the term gets people, people's attention, but I think the actual underpinning um, kind of processes behind it are kind of quite well established. Um, but I do agree that some of the, you know, some of the technology is quite revolutionary. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Let's talk about another term that's getting a lot of press today, Nigel artificial intelligence and AI there. So let me ask you uh, this question this way. So there's a lot of hype, but is it enough hype? Or is, is it, it enough much? hype? <laughs> yes. <laughs> or is it too much hype? Yeah. I think nobody's ever asked me before if it was uh, enough hype. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, and I think if we believed uh, a lot of the hype that there is, that um, perhaps we'd be living in a very different world to the one that we're living in at the moment. Uh, or maybe we wouldn't actually be living in a world at all. Um, but um, so again, it's a it's a kind of bit of a yes and no answer. So the the, the hype is a good thing because it gets it on everybody's radar and it gets people's attention. And you know, every single startup that you kind of see or hear of has got AI somewhere in its mission statement or or its kind of title. Um, the kind of reality is um, that there is an awful lot of hype and a lot of people that are riding the, the kind of wave of the term. Um, and, and that does, to some extent, extent, distract from where we actually are with artificial intelligence. Um, you know, if you kind of go back to the original terminology around kind of machines that think, um, you know, uh, in, you know, we, we're not at the point where we've got a thinking machine. Um, and you know, if, if I'm honest from a personal point of view, I'm not sure we ever will be. Um, but um, you know, but that's a kind of personal view. Um, but also, you know, it's the, the kind of term gets misused. Um, uh, you probably remember um, Kasparov when he got beaten by Deep Blue. Uh, he said, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't get beaten by an artificial intelligence, got beaten by a $10 million alarm clock. You know, and what he was basically saying is, you know, it, it was good at the process um, that it was given to do, winning at chess, but that was all it was good at. Um, and, and it had kind of like, you know, power and it had um, kind of ability to compute far, far faster than he could, but it wasn't outthinking him it was just going faster than he could and processing faster. And I think that's pretty much where we are with AI at the moment. You know, the kind of the combination of big data and the combination of all the power that we've got in the cloud and machine learning algorithms are kind of creating what appears to be intelligence, but actual real intelligence, I think, is, is still some way off. So, Nigel, let me ask you this. Where does simple logic-based coding and programming end 
and artificial intelligence begin? Because as we all know, you can do an if-then statement and then take an action through a normal software programming environment. So a lot of people might be referring to that even as artificial intelligence. So let me ask you directly, where does programming stop and artificial intelligence begin? Um, so pretty much most AI at the moment, in my opinion, is simple algorithms. Um, so it's kind of regression, it's outlier detection, it's kind of using algorithms that have been around for some time. Um, and, and, and that's fine, you know, that, that's kind of fine because those things are performing a function. Um, mm -hmm. and, and actually, as I say, you know, the combination of the compute power and those algorithms and the data are actually getting some kind of great results. Um, I still think that, you know, kind of companies aren't maximizing the benefit that they can get from even those results. Um, but in terms of kind of intelligence, you know, I, I think as we start to look towards um, kind of deep learning and neural networks, and we're starting to kind of map ways of kind of processing that kind of more closely match the way that we think, still not really exactly. I think that's as we start to kind of approach uh, artificial intelligence. But a lot of it at the moment is, is kind of, um, you know, pattern matching on steroids, really, and, and kind of uh, algebra on steroids. Oh, yeah. You know, at Regalix, we do a lot of customer-facing business operations in the system implement process. So we're using a lot of artificial intelligence around chatbots and uh, voice-enabled digital assistants so that you can um, answer a lot of questions that customers might have before a human even gets on the phone, or you can route a call, route a lead, uh, if they have these six problems, then we can route you to number one, all those kinds of things. So there's really an augmented role. Mm -hmm. So you're just trying to make the um, you're just trying to make the experience, the customer experience better and easier and faster for customers. So that's how we're kind of applying it in specific ways throughout the digital interactions between companies and their customers out there. Yeah, and I see that I see that a lot. Um, you know, lots of people are interested in in chatbots at the moment, and I think, um, you know, again, we talk about kind of the hype behind AI. There's an awful lot of hype behind chatbots as well, and everybody kind of feels that their organisation ought to to kind of have them, whether that be customer facing or kind of inter internally. Um, and there's a lot of good reason behind it, really, because you know, at the end, what you're trying to do is make the customer interaction more friendly, and you're trying to kind of create a better a uh, better environment for kind of people to do their work. Um, the other thing that's interesting is, you know, with all the uh, voice enabled technologies we've seen now, so, you know, Cortana and Siri and Alexa uh, and all those kind of devices, um, it, it creates an environment that we can add voice enablement onto. So your example of your chatbot that you've created, you know, and uh, at some point at the time, it would be easy just to add a voice interface to it. So rather than kind of sit there to kind of type in or, or on a mobile device, simple voice interaction. And I think that's why kind of a lot of people are excited about it. Um, but I agree, a lot of it is, is kind of process. I mean, some of the um, things that are kind of closer to artificial intelligence are probably some of the cognitive services, um, you know, some of the things that are image recognition and voice recognition and those kind of things because they're, they're trained, trained neural networks. But if you actually think about it, um, you know, to train a neural network on an image, takes thousands of images to kind of get it somewhere close to being accurate. You know, if you asked a five-year-old child, if you gave it three pictures of a cat and then showed it something that was roughly resembled a cat, it'd say that it was a cat. Um, you know, it, it can kind of make that leap kind of quite quickly. Uh, and that's kind of like real intelligence. But, we're, you know, with AI at the moment, we're still at that point where we need an awful lot of training data. Um, and, you know, another, another kind of can of worms to open, obviously, is with the training data that we then use, um, people start to kind of question whether ethically we're using the right training data, whether, you know, there are kind of black box algorithms, whether, you know, we've used too many pictures of kind of white males to be kind of blunt with you in order to kind of train pictures of faces. Um, so all of these discussions go on and kind of cloud some of the, uh, um, cloud some of the progress that we, we need to make. So Nigel, there's a word that's complementary to artificial intelligence and that's machine learning. Even though it's complementary, there's still a lot of confusion around it. I read different articles that say machine learning is actually a subset of artificial intelligence. Others think that machine learning is a standalone category of technologies. So in your opinion, Nigel, how does machine learning fit in with artificial intelligence? And a lot of people kind of call um, you know, it, it machine, le machine learning analytics on steroids. Um, and I think it, I think it is, you know, it's, it's kind of just using a lot of compute power 
to, to you know, analyze masses of data. Um, but there's nothing wrong with that, providing <laughs> that, you know, you're kind of getting the insight that you kind of need from it. Um, and I think, you know, if you, if you link the kind of analytics to some really good visualizations, then there's kind of massive power in that. Um, and, you know, you start to kind of reveal really interesting insights in the data. One of the things that is quite interesting is how um, kind of artificial intelligence, if we're going to call it that, is kind of being used to kind of create some of those insights as well. So one of, one of the questions, you know, you, you probably get asked a lot as well. People say, I've got some data. Can you give, give me some insights? Um, and, and kind of historically, we would kind of say, well, what's in your data? Kind of how is it structured? What kind of insights are you looking for? But now through using some of the power of artificial intelligence, we can glean quick insights into the data and get it to sort of find correlation between different parts of the data sets um, and then make some suggestions to, you know, are you interested in, um, you know, the fact that, um, you know, one country's expenditure is kind of far greater than another, um, uh, you know, and if, and if you are, you know, is that kind of a, a data set you want, might want to do some more manipulation on? So I think, you know, we're starting to use artificial intelligence with artificial intelligence to kind of, um, you know, generate even more insight. So, Nigel, we've talked about a lot of different things now. We've talked about digital transformation. We've talked about artificial intelligence. We've talked about machine learning. We've talked about algorithms and big data analytics. Now, how does all of that relate to automation and robotics? We hear so much about robotic process automation and people, you know, going to be automated out of their jobs and all kinds of references like that. But let's look at the business value. Where do you see the business value and what role does automation play in all this? Yeah, so it's interesting because you asked me if uh, kind of machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence were one and the same thing. And I said they weren't really. Um, and I kind of think the same with RPA, uh, robotic process automation. I think that's not really artificial intelligence either, but I think that's probably less like artificial intelligence than machine learning. Um, but but after having said that, it plays a, a massive part for a lot of organizations. Um, and, and I think, you know, the kind of value from it um, is, is kind of looking at those kind of business processes um, and, and just like purely putting them through a, an automation process. Quite often, there's not a massive intelligence in it. It is kind of repetitive tasks that are being performed or, or kind of learned and, and performed. Um, so I think, you know, for a lot of organizations, it's kind of where they start. So they start by looking at some kind of processes and see, you know, whether they can kind of take um, some of the kind of load off of people and kind of automate that part of the process. And I think that kind of starts them on their kind of uh, AI journey, if you like, um, because then as they start to kind of get benefit from that and they're able to kind of achieve things kind of uh, faster, then they look for other parts of whether that be machine learning or, or co cognitive parts of AI uh, as ways to kind of supplement it. Um, so I think it, it does play ma a massive part. Um, but I, I think, you know, again, over time, we'll probably see the kind of RPA side of it start to slow now um, because it's kind of, again, it is quite a well-trodden path. Lots of organizations are using it. It's kind of well understood. Um, and I think that they're actually looking for the next layer of value that they can kind of get. And that probably, unless, you know, the RPA um, um, kind of providers start to uh, kind of innovate and kind of create new, new technologies, which I'm sure they will. Um, then I think that kind of people will look to more to machine learning and, and artificial intelligence to kind of supplement it. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think it's, um, you know, it's something that I kind of see everywhere. Um, but it kind of does lead on to an interesting point, because at one point I nearly said, you know, that the RPA kind of replaces people. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and as we kind of talk about these technologies, um, that's definitely not what we mean. So, we, 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 you know, we're not talking about people being kind of replaced or displaced by the technology. We're talking about augmentation. So how can I take re repetitive processes that I might be kind of undertaking and how can I automate that to allow that person to do something which is more, um, to use the cognitive word again, uh, more cognitive or cerebral or, or kind of creative um, and, and use, you know, use their skills in kind of other ways. Oh, yeah. I always, in, when I have those discussions, the first kind of image that comes to my mind is turn by turn navigation. You know, we, we don't want to use turn by turn navigation where when we, when we ask to go somewhere, it's really a room full of people with headsets and maps spread out on a table. All those kinds of things. Those are things we, that are repetitive, 
that just need to happen uh, at the snap of a fingers. We don't need a lot of people rubber stamping and passing on to the next desk. You know, that really needs to be an automated process. We see, a, and of course, that can go into hundreds and thousands of different processes that there's really no value for having somebody just move a piece of paper forward. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the other thing with it is that lots of organizations aren't looking to get rid of people. So what they're looking to do is increase their capacity and their ability to kind of meet new market trends. Uh, and what they want to do is to do that with the same people and the same amount of people that they've got, but add automation to it to enable them to kind of scale out. So, you know, as kind of margins for kind of everything kind of get smaller um, and we want to kind of grow our business, the way that we do that is by using kind of automation, machine learning and artificial intelligence to augment people, to allow them to do the tasks that they're valuable uh, are kind of doing and then using the technology to kind of scale out with. Oh, yeah. And if you're if you're able to move people uh, more into innovation so you can stay on top of these emerging trends and fast changing customer behaviors, then, of course, there's going to be some training involved there as well, because that's a whole different cultural environment when you're in that fast pace of innovation and you're looking for the next opportunity and competitive advantage. I would, matter of fact, agree with you absolutely that uh, companies need to be able to not they need to capture competitive advantages early and before their competitors in the area of innovation. And if they take long and if they're a late adopter, they miss out on all those. They miss out on the data, the opportunity to learn from innovation because they don't even get access to the, the information around innovation if they're not involved in it. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And, and the kind of term that I like is, uh, you know, as we all kind of like live longer and we're, we're having to kind of learn, uh, um, kind of work longer, um, we're all becoming kind of come in lifetime learners. So it, it's about kind of unlearning some of the things we do, relearning new things. Um, and that kind of learning process in an organization culturally is really important and, and one that's kind of at the heart of Microsoft. Um, and the reason is there's a really strong correlation between learning and being creative and being creative and being innovative. Uh, and when you kind of add the power of those things together, that's kind of what keeps an organization kind of fresh and on the edge of kind of all the kind of breaking things. So um, you know, again, I, I think kind of learning is a massive part of kind of every organization's culture now or should be. Um, and, and that kind of fosters the kind of creation and innovation you're talking about. So let me wrap up here, Nigel, by asking you this. You talk to all the major systems integrators and consulting companies out there on, on a regular basis. What are some of the big trends that you're seeing out there that, that you're starting to see that might not even be on everybody's mind yet? So, so the one that I would like to be on their mind, let me start with that one first, um, is, is the kind of evolution of cloud computing and, uh, and kind of Microsoft and, and a number of other companies are all working now on quantum computing. Um, and, and it's been kind of maybe a bit of a, a kind of unicorn thing in the past, uh, you know, this kind of mythical beast that, you know, may, maybe it might, might not happen. I think quantum computing is starting to become very real now. Um, and the, the kind of power and the, the kind of revolution that will come from quantum computing will just be immense. Um, uh, you know, you're kind of talking about um, kind of slowing down of kind of Moore's law um, kind of now over time because it's just getting harder and harder to kind of keep that, you know, two times every 18 months up. In quantum computing, there are kind of exponential kind of power ups that we can kind of get from it. And I'm really excited that, you know, the next. Um, whatever period of time I cannot disclose, but, but not in a too far distant future, you know, we'll start to see some kind of real power from quantum computing. So that's the one that when I talk to kind of my customers, I try and get them excited about it because I think, you know, it, it not only it helps start them on their kind of cloud journey with what we can do now, but kind of gives them a pointer to the kind of power that we're going to have in the future and some of the kind of really big life-changing problems um, like climate change, um, you know, carbon emissions, kind of really big problems. So, so that's kind of, you know, that's my, I, I thought I'd kind of wedge that in there. Um, and, and I guess the, the, the other thing is I, I kind of see this, a very similar conversation kind of happening on a regular basis. And that is um, everybody is amassing big data. So, you know, everybody has been kind of told that, you know, you need to kind of capture this data. And, and the, the, you know, these masses of big data now, are starting, people are starting to say, well, I've got it. What do I do with it? Um, how can I get intelligence from it? Um, and I would use the word intelligence rather than kind of pattern matching as well. So rather than just how can I find some patterns in it, how can I find some 
some real insight from it that I may not have found before. Uh, and again, you know, we're starting to see kind of the edge of some of the technologies now um, where it can kind of understand data sets and can understand patterns and correlations um, that we would never be able to do, um, have, have done before. So I, I think they're kind of all excited at the fact that, you know, they're starting hopefully to be able to see that the big data that they've got and they're starting to amass uh, is kind of join, joining together and that they are going to be able to get some kind of really big, big insights from it and actually get a return on the investment that they've been making in the kind of analytics and the data scientists and all of those kind of roles. Um, and the other thing that's kind of really important as well is, is to um, not to have that exclusively for data scientists. So we need to kind of make a way of that being available to the person that's a, you know, an Excel spreadsheet user uh, and the kind of person that's, uh, you know, the, the kind of the business evangelist that, that isn't a data scientist. We need to kind of be able to get those tools into everybody's hands. And that's the other thing that I'm kind of seeing that, that people are kind of getting quite excited about is how these technologies are starting to kind of move out of the data science realm and into the kind of hands of kind of people uh, and quite often people that are kind of really creative and really understand business problems as well. Um, and, and I think, you know, that that's a kind of key a key trend for me, you know, they, they are really starting to see that they're going to get some value out of the data that they've got. Oh, yeah, I keep seeing the term citizen developer pop up uh, <laughs> now. You know, the ability for a business analyst to be able to actually have enough of the tools and the tools being simple enough for them to get a lot of value. Well, thank you for sharing that. One last question, then I'll let you go uh, and let you uh, have your weekend back, is leadership must be just uh, the most challenging job right now. To be in a leadership position with um, with technology racing ahead, with um, uh, fast-changing consumer behaviors going sideways and going this direction, um, where uh, time is being compressed, so you can't have the five-year, three-year to your even one year plans, things change too quick. How do leaders go about actually doing their job in this kind of speed, uh, you know, an environment where speed is emphasized so much? Yeah, absolutely. So kind of seeing a lot of devolution now, so people kind of devolve in some of their, their kind of roles to other people to allow them the kind of think time. Um, and uh, and I think I think you're absolutely right. It's really kind of hard to keep on the top of it. Um, and, and I think that I've seen in the past, you know, a lot of kind of innovation projects that have kind of started from the ground up and not really gone anywhere. I think leadership really gets now that that kind of innovation and creativity and, and business change is key to their business. Um, and they can always be the one that kind of drives that. Um, so I've seen, you know, a lot of kind of rebranding of the CIO title as the chief innovation officer. But I've seen that in lots of places now. Um, and, and kind of leaders kind of devolving down to those kind of people to say, you know, you're now empowered to kind of go and make change in the business. Um, and the kind of change that needs to be made is not the, you know, not the you know, 52 week plan, as you say, of kind of how we're going to roll out a new product. It's the it's the kind of agile, and I would use that in the kind of with the little a rather than the kind of agile as in agile methodology. Uh, you know, you need to be kind of agile, you need to be quick, you need to be iterative. Um, seeing lots of organizations organizing kind of hackathons and, and kind of prototyping sessions. So I, th I think, you know, from a leadership point of view, um, you, you kind of have to allow people within your organization to kind of experiment, to, to kind of make state and make mistakes but kind of keep those kind of small and manageable um, and kind of an, an, an iterative. Uh, and I think that, you know, hopefully um, that kind of allows people to uh, be more creative, have more ideas uh, and, and kind of really start to, you know, feel that they're empowered to kind of make change within the business. Um, because they're always in, in the past has seemed to have been, you know, a bit of a, a layer between leadership and the kind of people on the ground. And I think those lines are blurring now. Uh, and kind of leaders are, are, are putting more faith uh, kind of in, in the people that kind of work for them. And that faith is being rewarded by some really, really interesting kind of creativity and, and new things that are coming about. Oh, absolutely. I think it's time to um, to let ideas flow free rather than have ideas flow through an org chart. So the ability to extract the best ideas from all 
departments and all positions in your company, I think is essential for going forward. Yeah, I don't know if you've come across this term before, the hippo term. It's the highest paid pers person's opinion. Um, and, and I think, you know, that that's kind of definitely where we've been in the past. You know, you always had to go to that person to get sign off to do the thing that you wanted to do. And I think the change is that, you know, people are now feeling empowered. And, and though, you know, those business leaders are empowering people to actually go away and make those decisions and then reap the benefits from it. It needs to be kind of controlled. You know, you can't, you know, kind of run wild with this. But I think if, you know, if you keep it small and iterative and, and kind of creative, then I think there's you know immense benefit from it. Nigel, I want to thank you so much for spending your time sharing your experiences, sharing your wisdom with all of us. So thank you so much. It's a pleasure, Kevin. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having the opportunity for me to speak to you.